Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. This morning, I'm going to finish up your Christmas gift that I've spent much time making for you, and it's in Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. We're going to look at part 3. I've entitled it, The Gift That Keeps Giving. You're supposed to laugh. The gift that keeps giving, the body of Christ. So I want to share, just this week we got services on Christmas Eve. There's, a, there's like a hundred new invitations out on the visitor's table if you'd like to get one of those to hand out. We're going to look at John 3.16 uh, on Christmas Eve, the heart of the gospel. And so encourage you in that. And then Sunday morning we'll be looking at Matthew 2. So get out and do the work of an evangelist and bring people to hear that beautiful message that Jacob just shared with us. Thank you, Jacob. Well, let's look at Romans 12, verses 3 through 8. <clears throat> For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we may have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, or he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without hypocrisy. Let's ask God's blessing on these words. Father, I come before you and I thank you for this glorious gospel that we have been led by you to put our faith in and trust and surrender. I thank you for how uh, effective and beautiful it is. I thank you that we now have full access into your presence to stand blameless with great joy and awe and wonder. And I thank you, Lord, that you have called us out from this world of darkness into your marvelous light and now we dwell together as the body of Christ. And I pray, Lord, that we will continue to learn this morning how we're to function now as those who have been justified, as those who are accepted by their God. We are to have a love like no other for each other. And I pray that you will just continue to grow that and deepen that in our midst. Lord, teach us to love, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So Paul is presenting three essential truths in this section that we must understand for proper body life. And so we began looking at the presupposition in verse 3, and the presupposition as we journey now of learning how to work out the will of God is that we, we come in not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. We come in realizing that we all, he said, have been given a gift by God, and it's, it's from him and it's through him, it's, it's for the good of this body, and it brings humility because there's nothing of myself, it's not of me, it's not even for me, it's for your good and edification. And so we just don't think too much of ourselves, we think much of Christ, and we enter in, uh, in, in humility into this body. And then we looked at the picture that the church is to be in verses 4 through 5, and he, he brought the picture of a human body. And he wants us to see the unity that we have in Jesus Christ. We have all walks of life represented here this morning. And as we are joined to Jesus Christ by faith, there is a, a, a bond and a unity. What unites us together is one faith, one Lord, one hope, one baptism. We, we are united as united could be with all of our, the next part, our diversity, all the differences, instead of trying to get uniformity where we all act, think, dress, all, all the exact same way, we got all this difference and variance and different gifts in the body of Christ. So we're, we're unified, but we're, we're diverse. And then we saw, but we're dependent on one another. And we need each other's gifts. The body causes the growth of the body. And so all of our gifts are, are we're going to grow us up into the head, the Lord Jesus Christ. I need your gifts. I need your faith, your grace. We're, we're all dependent on one another to grow up into Jesus Christ. And so what a beautiful picture of the body, the human body that we're the body of Christ. 
And that's where we left off on our third P this morning now, the presupposition, the picture. And now we're to practice these gifts that God has given to us for each other's good. So look with me in verse 6. <clears throat> Since we have gifts that differ according then to the grace that has been given to us individually. And so this is big, is we're going to try to bring this all together, what we've been studying this morning. God has allotted in verse 3 to each a measure of faith. So each one of you have a measure of faith that varies different degrees, but faith is the root of all spiritual gifts. Romans 1 through 11, we, we saw the gospel, our faith. Romans 1 through 5 is faith in our justification, being made right with God, being declared righteous, being accepted in the presence of God. And then Romans 6 through 8, faith lays hold of Christ to be changed and to be transformed. And now Paul says, grace gifts were given to us, and faith then looks to the resources of God, His grace, to practice them. And so these gifts aren't, thank you God, now I run out and use them. They're, they're, they're dependent on the grace of God to flow through us for the good of this body. And so faith always looks away from you and looks to Christ. And it looks to grace then to use these gifts. And we can't go back to the law with natural gifts and say, go work in the church. Let me come work hard now. And that just fills our churches and it's why so little is happening. There's so little conformity to Jesus Christ because people are running around working with natural talents. You just got to serve so God might accept me because that's just what Christians do. And it's just all the wrong mindset and therefore the, the fruit of God's grace flowing into the body is lacking. It's not flowing from grace through faith, going into this body to manifest grace to one another. So I pray that you're hearing this. This could change the world. 500 people serving by the grace given to them by God, by faith, being used to build up every member into the glorious head. What a beautiful picture of what God has designed the church to be. And so faith lays hold of Christ and it receives grace and it brings it into my heart and then it puts it out into this body. One preacher said, faith is leaning on the supernatural grace to flow through you to bring blessing and power and growth and purity to his body. This is supernatural what he's doing, and we can't make it natural. There's just too much flesh and self-sufficiency and wrong motives in the way that we serve God and one another. Too much Romans 12, 3, thinking too highly of yourself and, and pride instead of faith and grace flowing from it. And so as we come this morning, it's, it's not my natural giftedness. You, you might have natural giftedness, but what Paul's talking about here is so much bigger than just natural things. God, never leave me to my own abilities. That's not what we need. I get nervous every Sunday. God, don't leave me to my natural ability. Nothing will happen. My grace gift will do nothing to this sweet body that I love with all my heart. The Spirit has to come and attend your word and work in hearts that grace would flow. What could happen if the Spirit moves in your hearts and you get the vision of Romans 12, 3 through 8? I can't do anything in my natural strength or gifting to accomplish it. The Holy Spirit can do beautiful things through each and every one of us in our gifts. And we do them by faith. We, we look to grace. And he gets all the glory for that. Never get, give a man or woman glory in the church. It's all from God and to God and for his glory. And pride gets in the way of this. It dams up grace flowing into the body when you receive praise or want it. So grace and faith are the root of all spiritual gifts. And I, I want that to be encouraging because sometimes you look and say, I don't got a lot of natural gifts and, and, and I'm afraid to try to do things in the body. Well, if it's by grace through faith, it, it just sets everybody free to be used by God for the good of everybody in this church. So praise God that it's not your natural talents. So what I love then 
is that I just don't get, here's your gift. And it just kind of stays the same the rest of your life. It, it is that the use of these gifts, I want you to hear this, it's not static. Our, our gifts then fluctuate by the weakness of our faith and the strength of our faith. They're, they're, they're just Sometimes they go up and down. Growth in Christ, a, a teaching gift, can grow and become more useful as you grow in Christ. You can be seasoned with grace, as it were. We can all be growing in grace and faith to be more useful with our gifts in the body of Christ. And so some Sundays I walk in here and I just need encouragement. And some Sundays I come in here, I just want to give it. And it's just, this interdependence is so beautiful with these giftings. And so I want you to hear it one more time. It is by faith, through grace, that we exercise these gifts. And so we don't fake it. Natural ability and sinful motives will never produce what Paul's talking about. That will never be what God has so gifted and designed the body of Christ for. What a beautiful way to infuse grace into his body by grace gifts. The Greek word is charismatos. And so every one of us should be charismatics in the true sense of the word. Grace gifts by the Holy Spirit working through us to build each other up into the image of the head, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so people get grace through us. We're the instrument of God's outpouring of his grace. And there are many means of grace, many means. But here's another one that God uses in his body. This is a big one. And so I want grace to fall on this body by faith and let it flow through your gift where it's not about me, it's about God's love for this body and him gifting us and grace flowing through us. So to him be the glory forever in the church. So here's your exhortation. Strive to not try to build facades then in the church and try to look or be or act like something you're not. Grow in faith so you can help other people grow in faith. Get Romans 12. Paul said we we learn the will of God through the word, the renewing of our mind. Renew your minds this morning and bring every excuse that you might have for not loving the body and renew your minds and realize what God has designed and enter into the body of Christ like this. For this is the law of Christ. And there's more to help us do this in the body of Christ. So let's keep moving. There's more in this passage. Our practice in the body, I I think I get more what Paul's doing here now. Last time when I preached this 20 years ago, I, I exegeted each gift, and I think I spent an hour close on just prophecy. And I I think that's all important, but it's good to grow in grace. (laughs) But what I think Paul's after is not the detailed list of each gift, but I think what he's after is how to get this into Southside Bible Church. And and so I can give you a list and you can understand them and go home, and that that doesn't satisfy um, God or my soul. (laughs) how these grace gifts by faith will flow. And so let me help you just a little more with getting them into our body. I won't be happy if you just walk away knowing your list of spiritual gifts, what's an ordinary gift, what's an extraordinary gift, which ones ceased, which ones continue. Paul's just got bigger fish to fry, and and so do I. And come with me to verse 6. Since we have these gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, Each of us is to exercise them accordingly. So in the New American Standard, uh, it's in italics. And I I hope most of your Bibles have this thing in italics. So my question is, why is it in italics? And you can even yell out the answer if you feel led. Why why is it in italics? Is it just a bad font? Huh? Good. So it's it's not in the original text. That, That sentence isn't in the original text. It's supplied. And because in the Greek text, there is no verb for these gifts that are being expressed here. And so when that happens in the Greek, you have to go supply the verb from the nearest context or the language or the flow to say, what what is he getting at? Because he didn't put a verb here. 
And so I like the translation in the New American Standard, let each exercise them accordingly. Because that's what Paul's teaching, these gifts. So if you got this gift, go use it. But I want you to consider one thing. He says, it, so if you got service, let him exercise it accordingly in his service. And if you have the gift of teaching, let him exercise it accordingly in his teaching and, and so on. Does that do much for you? What is, what is the point? If the gift of teaching, if you have it, let him exercise it. It just doesn't add anything. Do you see what I'm getting at? It doesn't, hey, if you got the gift of, of teaching, teach. If you got the gift of serving, serve. It just doesn't do much. And as I was reading a bunch of commentators this week and preachers, I think several of them are onto this. <clears throat> there seems to be more supplied to the verb that's not there than just let them exercise it accordingly. And this is what's called a horatory participle, and it carries the idea of action, so you can't get away from that. It's a good translation. Do it. Go use your gifts. But journey with me. I think there's something bigger to bless Southside Bible Church. And let's look at Paul's flow and argument and see if we can find what should be supplied. And the biggest turn in the Bible was therefore. Romans 12, 1, therefore, because of the gospel and all that he's done and that you stand accepted in the beloved by the work of Jesus Christ, the mercies of God, offer up your bodies a living sacrifice. Then in verse 3, don't come into the assembly thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to think. And so what I want you to get is God doesn't just want your doing. And, and I remember reading a book once and the pastor said, tell your people to quit serving. I was like, what? That's what you spend your whole life trying to get them to do. And he's saying so many are just serving to try to get God's acceptance and his favor and doing it from wrong motives and wrong hearts. And he's correcting that issue right here. If you teach, you serve, you admonish. The whole Bible has been written to bring us under grace so sin will not have dominion over us, that we can fulfill the law of Christ and love God and love others. God doesn't want, just go do it. What does he want? Some of you might be going, if that isn't what he wants, I'm lost. Let me show you what he wants. In verse two, he wants you to know his will. We parked on that. What's his will as we come into the body of Christ? Therefore, coming into this body knowing that you're right with God through the work of Jesus Christ alone. I'm walking in accepted, not trying to get accepted. I'm already loved, not trying to get loved. I'm, I'm, I'm walking in as one who's come out of a courtroom, and I'm walking in by the mercies of God that I have been taken up with. I can't get over his mercies. And I walk into this body so full of the mercies that I've received in Christ and I'm renewing my mind to know the will of God. And I'm coming in not with pride, but humility. Because remember, faith looks to Christ for everything. And so I, there's nothing in me. Faith is everything is in Christ. So you walk in here in humility because this gospel has humbled you to look only to Jesus. And now we move into using our gifts with one another with what spirit? I come to you in your need saturated in God's mercy, in humility and love. That's the force that he wants us to come into as we use our gifts. My favorite teacher on this subject, he wisely observed that it's so important, this, this truth in the body of Christ, because he says, look at each one of these gifts. And every one of these gifts assumes something. They assume that the stronger is moving into the weaker, someone's coming to help someone who, who, who has a resource to give. So if, if you serve, you, you come and there's someone who's in need, there's someone who needs help. And if you teach, there's someone with knowledge wanting to impart knowledge. If you exhort, there's one who, who needs something. If you give, they're needy. And if you lead, you're, you're leading others, you're over them. And if you're showing mercy, they're, they're hurting and they're, they're struggling and they're dying. And as you move in to help them, this is big. So as you come in, you come humble, humble, mercy-loving people. 
or the body of Christ will be hurt. You know, many people have been wounded from the body of Christ because we come in arrogant, running them over. Look at me. I got all these helps and gifts and you get the blessing of receiving them. And we have done more damage by going this wrong way. See, it won't be the grace of God being poured out into their lives when we come that way. But it'll be flesh, harm, hurt, distrust that fills our land. How many I counsel who have been deeply hurt by these gifts not being used the way Paul is exhorting us. There's just kind of this sweet place of repentance this morning to say, oh God, I, I want to walk into this body saturated in mercy, full, ready to love and come humble to the saints to help any one of them with the gift that you gave me for their good. And I think that's what Paul was getting at in 1 Corinthians 13. You're wanting these showy gifts. Seek love. Pursue after love. Because without that, no man will see the Lord. So God's looking for an overflow of mercy-loving saints who are humble, meeting each other's needs with the strength and love that He supplies. And faith is that. I love mercy, and it's all from him. The just shall live by faith, and you shall serve each other by faith. And people respond to this. Having it all together, the Bible answer man, getting people exhorted, trying to be noticed, has never built up anyone into the head of the Lord Jesus Christ. It will never happen that way. So what would happen if we all did this to each other, the kingdom of God would be at hand. And the world would say, what's the hope within you at this church? So you need to see the greatest mercy that has ever been shown to mankind in Jesus Christ, and you will explode in serving. How God has helped me in my great need and my helplessness that I'm given to serve in the body of Christ, and I won't make people feel belittled or lowly, I am what I am by the grace of God alone. And this is what I want to burst forth into this church. It's my prayer for me and for every one of you sitting here. And so let's take a look at this list of gifts now in that context. First one's a little tricky. So I'm going to ask that you be merciful and humble with me while I try to explain it. So look at this list. <clears throat> And again, I think it's just a, a picture of now flowing through these truths. <clears throat> if you have prophecy, exercise it according to the proportion of his faith. If service and is serving, and then he'll go through the list. So the first one, again, is a little tougher than all the other gifts. And, and we could spend a long time on this. We kind of talked about it. We could either do a couple-month study on prophecy, or I could just fly over it. And I chose to fly over it. So the elders studied this out quite a long time for weeks and but months studying on our own as we came together. And here's where we came, just going to give you a big picture and, and then kind of move on to the other gifts. But kind of two main views on spiritual gifts in, in the church. And one's called a cessationist. And that would be that the extraordinary gifts in the Bible have ceased um, when, the, when the canon was finished. And then there's the non-cessationist who would say, no, all the gifts would still be in existence today. And so we held the cessationist view for two decades. And we, we still practice that way. But here was the problem. The reason they say that it stopped was in 1 Corinthians 13. It says when the perfect comes, these things will be done away with, these gifts. And so when the canon of Scripture was completed, those gifts were finished. And it, it wraps up really nice. But if you study that passage out, that is, not, that is not what it's saying in 1 Corinthians 13, and we'd be willing to sit down and help anybody in that passage. So where we landed was a non-cessationist um, because we don't see a clear verse that says they stopped right here. And we pretty much practice, though, as a church, with, as a cessationist church. So if you have any of these gifts, the extraordinary gifts, uh, it, they need to be practiced the way the New Testament defines them, which throws almost all of them off today that we see in some, some circles 
It's not practiced even the way the Bible put it in the New Testament. And to date, no one has shown up with these extraordinary gifts. And so as we look at it, you always had the apostle and the prophets. That, you know, in the New Testament, they would talk about, you know, the, the church is built on the teachings of the apostles and the prophets. And then you have the healings. And the healings were true healings. There were healings that were every time and 100%, and they, they heal. And then there were miracles and the tongues and the interpretation of tongues. And we believe that God could do all of those things. And I, I've seen him heal people, but I, I do not have the gift of healing. Um, I've heard of some beautiful things on the mission field. I have a, a dear friend who went to, uh, um, I can't remember where it was, but he didn't know the language and he started preaching the gospel and people got saved and God was just giving him that. But it's not a consistent every kind of gift. So we hold this view that as we look at the extraordinary gifts, we see a decreasing emphasis and usage of them through the New Testament epistles. You can just watch the older books, and as you, you get there, they're not even talking about these gifts anymore. Then as you look in church history, you just keep seeing the diminishing of them being used from what we see in Acts. And then the scriptures teach that there was a purpose for these gifts. Does God have a purpose for these gifts and what they were for? And they were given as attestations to corroborate the, the first, the message of Jesus, and, and then the message of the apostles. And so we will call these gifts the credentials of their message. And how do we know that they're speaking for God and the words of God? And these sign gifts were to show the early church's authority. 2 Corinthians 12, 12. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance, by signs and wonders and miracles and authenticated these messengers of God. And since there was no New Testament, you had the apostles and the prophets speaking forth these truths. And they were preparing the canon, which is the Bibles that we hold in our hands. And when they were done, we see that there was no more need for it because now we have the mind of God in this Bible. And now he, he's equipped the church with what we're going to look at with teachers and exhorters and preachers because we have the revelation of God in written form. And so prophecy is the only extraordinary gift in this list. And prophecy, I just want to nail it down. It's the foretelling of the future, the Old Testament and the New Testament. They spoke the words of God. Prophets were men and women who spoke under, I want you to hear this, the immediate influence of the Holy Spirit to communicate the mind of God to his people. And so these prophets were vehicles of authoritative divine revelation. <clears throat> Hodge, the commentator, said that you need to know the distinction between prophets and apostles, and it appears to have been that the inspiration of the apostles was abiding. They always had it. And they were the infallible and authoritative messengers of Christ. Inspiration of the prophets was occasional and transient. And teachers were not necessarily inspired, but taught to others what they themselves had learned from the scriptures of inspired men. The gifts of prophecy, like apostleship, um, most don't argue that apostles ceased. And they, they were joined together as laying that foundation. And so we would see that they ceased. Something that is no longer with the church since having completed the Old and the New Testaments. And so we no longer need it. The Bible is the recorded testimony of inspired men and women. You even had prophetess. And so the canon is here. We have that foundation. And now the Spirit performs the ministry of illumination of the Scriptures to you. And so preaching is the gifts of exhortation and teaching. Prophecy was an immediacy. It was a word that came to them. And so preaching, you study, think, prepare, arrange, and pray and prophecy is a very different bird from teaching and preaching. So I just want you to hear that. Usually people take prophecy and say it's preaching. And they're, they're very separate and distinct things. And does that mean that the Holy Spirit no longer inspires us or compels us or prompts us? And I would say that, that he does. But now he uses the word of God to instruct us on his will. And so the Spirit will lead us. We just don't call that prophecy Ephesians 2.20, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, that foundation has been laid. And so that's where we've landed. Uh, if you differ from our stance, 
um, I would call this a non-essential. If you call prophecy what we would call the leading of the Holy Spirit, things he led you to do, we, we offer you the right hand of fellowship and we can journey and labor together with a different understanding of prophecy. So any questions? That's simple, isn't it? So we are non-cessationists who practice as cessationists. <clears throat> <coughs> So if service in his serving, the Greek word for service is diakonia, the root word for deacon. 1 Corinthians 12, 28, God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, there's that combination, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings and helps and administrations and various kinds of tongues. The, the Greek word for helps is this service here. And this word also can mean ministry, it's a very broad word. It's used 70 times in the New Testament. It's a variety of gifts. It could be a nursery worker, going to mow grass, giving rides, handing out bulletins. There's many ways to use this gift. And again, every believer is called to serve, but there's just some men and women who have a spiritual gift in this area, and it's beautiful to watch. And so what Paul says then is you who have this gift in your serving, as you go and serve this body, it's with an eye to the one who did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. As one who is not serving to get accepted by God, but because you are, but you lose your life because he lost it for you and now you're accepted. That's your motivation. The mercies of God and humility as we go and use this gift to serve the body of Christ. Do it in humility because those people are in need not bossy, not lording it over, not making them feel like an inconvenience. Come as lowly as the Christ did in a humble manger. If you have the gift of serving, serve. He who teaches in his teaching, God gifts his body with teachers. 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be shamed, handling accurately the word of truth. So the gift of teaching is important. It not, might not just be that you're very systematic. You got clear outlines and you're really smart and you know the Greek like no one else. It's one who teaches in light of the therefore. It's a gospel-centered teacher. He's Christocentric. He sees that Jesus said all this pointed to me. Paul said, I resolved to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. And so catch this, when he teaches, God changes people. They're metamorphosed that we looked at in the beginning of Romans 12.1. And they repent, they believe, and they're filled with hope. People become more like Christ under their teaching, not just smarter. That's a big difference than just sticking up people who are academic and know how to articulate things. When you teach, it needs to be in humility, not overthinking yourself. You're not God's gift to the world, just to the church for its good. It's all from Him. And you can almost tell in five minutes if someone's teaching for themselves or because they want you to see Jesus Christ. So to clearly interpret and bring forth before the saints of God His Word, take God's revealed Word and bring it to the people so they can feed upon it. And since apostleship and prophecy have ceased, this is so important to the church of God to bring the mind of God and the will of God to his people in the context of the gospel, not legalism. And the one who exhorts in his exhortation. This word can be to exhort or to encourage. We're, we're all called to encourage each other. Um, Romans 10.25, encourage each other as you see the day drawing near. But these are, again, special encouragers within the body of Christ. And I, I can't think of something the body could use more than anything is encouragers and exhorters. We, we need both. If gifted, bring this beautiful gift to the body of Christ. It's a beautiful word, parakaleo. Parakaleo, it's a come alongside of. It's what the, what the ministry of the Holy Spirit was described as he comes along. It's a paraclete, an advocate, a helper, a comforter, an encourager. 
It literally means one who's called alongside of another to help him out. Come alongside to encourage or to exhort a brother or sister. James Montgomery Boyce said, let the person who has this gift of getting alongside another person to help him or her really do it. Let him stand by his friend and really help him. Again, this is probably the most dangerous if you have pride. Right? My gift is exhortation. If you come with pride, you're going to destroy people. A bruised reed is not to be crushed. As you come to exhort, you're so aware of the gospel of Jesus Christ in your life that you always come in mercy. And so this gift is one who is gifted, one man said, to break up log jams. Some people in the body need encouragement and some need an exhortation. And this man or woman can discern which it is. And so you who have this gift, lose yourself in it, in the body of Christ. And he who gives, do it with liberality. And it means imparting or sharing. Given from one's own resources to meet the needs of others. This is a God-given proclivity to give what you have for the needs of other people. It's not just, I like giving Christmas presents. <laughs> it's one who imparts in the midst of the body of Christ. It just... These people can smell a need a mile away. <sighs> I like the attitude that Paul says, do it with liberality. The word means with simplicity, sincere concern, without ulterior motives. Come and give and give, give with liberality. Don't say, here, look at me. Look at my right hand knows what my left hand's doing. Now you owe me. You're indebted because I did this for you. I got influence. There's no other motive than there's a need. There's just a need, and because I was so needy and Christ met it, I just want to give mercifully to needs. God met every need that I had in Jesus Christ, and He's open-handed with me in His mercies that He has dispensed to me, so I am open-handed to other people. And he who leads, do it with diligence. He who leads when it's about Christ, it's done with diligence. And when I look at the mercy that I received in Christ, you just want to lead away, don't you, <laughs> leaders? You want to lose sleep. You want to labor to the point of fatigue. Whitfield preached 40 hours in a week. When he turned 40, he said, today I vow to finally start serving God for the first time. The mercies of God in Christ don't make you want to go work on your golf game. They don't want you to get lemonade and lay in a hammock. They make you want to lead with diligence when it's about Christ and humility. This gift brings diligence to see people conform to the image of Christ. And so leaders, do you have this? I say in love, step away if, if you don't. People want to follow leaders that are fueled by mercy and are humble. Right, wives? It's a joy to follow people like that. And he who shows mercy, do it with cheerfulness. He who shows mercy, one who has tasted the mercy of God, flows with mercy. You don't work it up. It's not, this is what I'm supposed to do. Good Christians do this. I'm going to do it. This is what comes out of me tasting the mercy of God in Christ. One of the most common complaints I've heard about American missionaries is you show up with complete pride. Here, I'm ready to fix everything. It's American missionaries here. And you, you need to move to those in need with humility, loving mercy, and you do it with cheerfulness. God doesn't want our acts of mercy and service as we grumble and complain the whole time. That's not what He wants. Someone who's so full of mercy, I just, it's, the Greek word is hilario, hilarious. I, I just, I love showing mercy because I drink it up all day long. His mercies are new every morning. So is my service. Just mercy. This is not a spiritual gift to grumble and complain. It's a deed of the flesh. Oh, that the mercies of God in Christ Jesus would be the fuel for our mercy. And that would be a well that never runs dry. 
that we would approach the ones needing mercy in humility. In absolute humility. Amen? Boy, what that would do. And so guys, are you moving toward this body as those who have just walked out of the courtroom justified by God? And I move into this body aware of that and living in reality of it. If you're not giving yourself to this body and you're just okay with that, you've got to go back to Romans 1-11 through and let this gospel fill and flood your heart again. If you're still in prison with the chains of bondage and guilt and saying, I just got to serve so I don't feel guilty, there's a sweet gospel to be not guilty by what Jesus Christ has done by living the life we should have and dying the death we deserved. Without that, you can never have what Paul is talking about. And that's why so many American churches, they're they're built on natural abilities or self-sufficiency. But what Paul is describing what the body of Christ is to be is so beautiful as through faith, as we believe and look away and, and his grace flows into this body through all of our gifts, we are going to begin to look like Jesus Christ. Soak in the mercy of God in Christ until it's what comes out of you. Renew your minds in the word of God to what his will is. For this is the will of God to be motivated by his love to love. May God grant us much more grace to be this kind of a bride to the one who gave himself up for us all. This is the fulfillment of the law to love one another. To God be the glory for this beautiful design that he has made in the body of Christ that can only be done supernaturally. Let's pray. Father, I come before you and I thank you for this beautiful section of Scripture. And I pray now, don't let us just get a list of gifts. God, let us go now infused by the faith that you've given us and the grace to just flow through us into this body. Lord, to, to help and strengthen and of this church. God, I pray that you would do mighty, mighty things in our midst as we just keep remembering the mercies of God in Christ Jesus. Lord, let, let love flow from your brothers, from these brothers and sisters of Christ that are seated here this morning by faith. God, I thank you for the glorious gospel. Let us join in lock shields to lift up the name of Jesus Christ and that all who come in this body would find healing from so many past hurts and sins to be conformed to the image of Christ and to find who we are in the body of Christ and to all join together and put him on display. God, we thank you for this, and it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.